Yes, it's the Blank Podcast. Hello, Jim. the Hello. Blank Podcast. We are here. Yes. Uh, I'm Jim Daly, and of course, Mr. Giles Paley Phillips is here. We are. Oh, we are here. How are in, you? In uh, Wimbledon. We are. We should do a shout out to uh, Outset Studio. Yes, we haven't used Outset before, and it's been very nice. It has been very nice. So, mm. shout out to them for, for housing us. Um, how are you doing this week? I'm not too bad. How are you? I'm very good, actually. What have you been up to? Because uh, you're preparing, aren't you, for some live shows? Am I yeah, right? I'm doing my first ever live stand up. Live, of course it's live. Uh, stand up, <laughs> it's not recorded. Uh, In your front room. Maybe one day it will be. Um, yeah, this August as part of the Camden Fringe. So I'm going to have details of that at some point. But uh, first ever well, solo show, yeah. Interesting enough, we were talking the other day about when we started the podcast and how, you know, obviously I had gone through a period of rights block and you had also had some fear for doing the stand up and you're getting back on the horse. Very much so. Mm. Yeah. And actually, I'm feeling really engaged with doing stand up at the moment. Written loads of new material and actually got almost back to like when I started and you're really excited to get back on stage again. So, yeah, that's been actually that I'd forgotten about. But that journey that we wanted to sort of track from the start mm. of pod one has actually almost come full circle. But also, me. I was wondering whether the podcast has helped in some I think way. it massively. Yeah. It's made me reevaluate myself, I think, mm. actually, and rethink about creativity and just listening to all these amazing creative people it makes you want to get out there and do it. Yeah, so yeah, absolutely. Been, um, and you've had some masterclasses from, from some yeah, top comedians. Yeah, Reggie Hunter, obviously. Yeah, David Baddiel. <laughs> David Baddiel, so that's helped. Yeah, so it's yeah. been amazing. Uh, so, um, yeah, in the future weeks, I'll let you know the dates mm. and stuff. If, uh, and if anyone We'd wants love to come to and hear watch, your dates. I'd love it if some viewers, listeners could come and uh, watch. It'd be amazing. Yeah, that would. Yeah, we'll keep us posted. Um, so today's guest is Alistair Humphrey. Yes. Who is, uh, among other things, National Geographic's Venture of the Year. Yeah. And, and he has got some incredible stories, um, feats of human endeavour that yeah. he's uh, accomplished over the last few years. Amazing stories. And also, there's, there's a, th- I discover in this podcast an urban myth that for years I thought wasn't mm. true is true. Oh, yes. And yes. Alistair confirms that on this podcast. Yeah. So that was a real... Amazing moment for yeah, me. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. Alistair is a fantastic human being and so inspiring. And yeah, I hope you really enjoy the podcast. Yeah. Let's let's crack on. This is Alistair Humphrey on The Blank Podcast. That high speed one that goes to... Canterbury and out that way. Oh, okay. Over that's called Southeastern. Southeastern, better than because Southern, which is what I'm on. We often this often comes it up. Does, on the <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, Thanks, man. Right. Uh, is yeah, Southern is just not good. I mean, <sighs> it's they only ever like from. So I come from via Lewis. So I'm living Seaford, which is right on the coast between Eastbourne and Brighton. That's probably the best way of describing it. And then they get the train to Lewis, which is like the sort of. It's the county town, so the mm. hub. Lewis is very nice. It's Har- very, very nice. Harvey's. Yeah. Yes, Harvey's Brewery's there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, God, it's been there for 200 years or something. Or maybe longer, I don't know. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, so it's the county town, and so all the trains kind of pump through there. So one's coming from Eastport. This is really boring. This is quite boring. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're talking about adventures. <laughs> I tell you what, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is my... People's as train as stories <laughs> is nearly as boring as when people describe their own dreams. <laughs> yes. yeah. Well, I was going to come on to that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, not, with, not with me in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, so you come from... Anyway, it's always... There's only ever four carriages. Oh, I hate when they do that. When they, they always... Yeah. I come in from Amersham on the Chiltern line and they always put on two carriages at peak time and then yeah. I'll, I'll go midday and it's like 10 carriages. Like, yeah. We don't need these carriages. Yeah, exactly the same. What are you exactly doing? Exactly the same. So there's like, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of people getting on and there's only four carriages to fit them in. So anyway. So yeah, that, that's why I'm delayed today. So okay. apologies for that. <laughs> More exciting chat. I like your watch. You've got, Thank like, you. you've got the bling version yeah, of mine. Well, Show, I, show oh, off. I, well, I know. Well, no. Okay, this was... Just, this, this, pod, this pod must be doing well. <laughs> Well, funny enough, they're actually not that much more expensive than the one oh. with the gold thing. So we're, we're, we've got Casio F, I, the F91Ws. Uh, and if Casio wants to sponsor the pod. Uh, I've, got, uh, I've got these in multiple colours. So I've got the I've nice. got mustard, green, grey, orange, pink. Uh, I think that might be... Oh, and a silver one. I've got a silver one as well. Oh, nice. But you've so got standard to what black. you wear? No. No, actually, I think this one looks... Because the gold one's quite blingy, like you said. Yeah. I actually have been wearing this quite a lot, but I have Man alternated. I have alternated, but the classic black I've got as well. Yeah, you can't. This is the best watch I've ever. Yeah, known. I used to have them. I used to have exactly that one, and then I tried a different watch, and I bought a watch off Next for like twenty quid, most I've ever spent on a watch. 
and it was like a sleek black watch. Looked really nice like during a, the day. What with a big face on it? Big face, sleek black numbers, black yeah. um, hands. Uh, but I realised it didn't have a backlight, so once the sun went down, I couldn't actually read the time <laughs> if I was out about in the evening because it was just black. So <laughs> and now it's phone out back. to look. Oh, yeah, literally, <laughs> yeah. it was so. Uh, yeah, it was. So I need to go back to a Casio. Well, what I love about them is they're fairly indestructible. The battery life is incredible. I mean, my my green one I've had for about eight breaks. Isn't yeah, it? that's the, the giveaway. Breaks. Not yeah. the they battery. perish. Yeah, yeah, yeah the straps break. You can buy a spare. Mm. I've, no, I've found on eBay. There's quite a few places. Yeah. So. so is that is that this is my watch of choice? So I did an yeah. expedition thing years ago that involves basically involved me having a ten thousand pound watch. And I thought, like, I am the daddy here. Wow. Except wearing it was annoying because, one, I felt like an absolute idiot. <laughs> I haven't got big enough biceps to wear a watch like that. <laughs> I felt like a prat. It was cumbersome. Also, it didn't have a stopwatch or an alarm or a light. Really? Which are the three the ideal uh, and things. And therefore, the I voluntarily F91W. said, bring, bring me back the so F91W. What, what did it have for that kind of money? Strong. But these are strong, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. So <laughs> um, yeah, it was strong and that was it. accurate, I suppose. Wow! So ten thousand pounds. So I've got a friend who's really into watches. He buys collect. He collects watches. Right. He said last time he was. He lives in Australia. He, won't, he probably hopefully be listening to the podcast. Yeah. Uh, Kai, hi if you're there. Uh, he went to London last time he was over. He went to London and he went and bought a very nice watch. And he said that he it was one of those places where he got taken down into the sort of basement and. The person was wearing gloves and all that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, wow. Like a jewellery yeah, store. Pop, yeah, like, probably like proper. Wow. And um, he had to de- decide between the two watches. And um, he found it really difficult to decide. Because <laughs> they, were, I assume, were both very expensive. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, the, the payoff of this anecdote was not as strong as the start of it. <laughs> no, I know, I know, I know. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Tell um, us a bit more about trains. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I would feel with a, with a watch that expensive, I would just feel like I'm going to lose it or break it the whole time. And the, the weight of responsibility mm. and probably the literal weight of the watch as well would weigh me down. So, um, yeah. so what? So, did you abandon the ten thousand pound watch quite quickly into the exploration expedition? Uh, well, it was not on the expedition. Can't be foolish to just dump it on a glass. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, well, no. I didn't <laughs> dislike it that much. Just, yeah, <laughs> for someone um, else to. F- I'm not paying upon, for this. Yeah. <laughs> but upon returning to the real world, I yeah. Went back, back to the. Yeah. Yeah. It feels more like my kind of watch as well. Yeah. yeah. Right, I'm getting a Casio. Keeping it real. Well, they're so not that expensive either. I mean, Giles might treat you to one. Maybe. I've got quite a few spares. <laughs> I could just borrow one. I could each week borrow a different Casio. Well, my, uh, my children have got them as well because they really like them. And so my eldest has got the blue one, the sky blue one. And Sonny, my little one, he had the green one. He borrowed my green one and that broke. Unfortunately, he was very upset. So now he's got my yellow one. Yeah. Um, which will probably inevitably break at some point. Has he got, have they got go big enough that. wrists for the holes? Just about. Okay. Then. Yeah, he's ten now, yeah, so yeah. yeah, it's like notch two on there. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite. He's got quite a lot of end. Yeah. Sort of sticking. So out. I've been a. I've been an F ninety one W user since the day when I could first get in the. First oh yeah, hole. yeah, yeah, really? yeah. My scrawny little. Now, did you have <laughs> a mini? So I had the. So I had one that was like the world times. So you could scroll through, and it would have. This was Casio as well, but uh, always Casio. You could scroll through the different time zones. Oh, wow. No, I haven't had that. Um, no. So I guess if you went abroad, which I never did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But only abroad to very specific places. Yeah, well, it was like, I think it was like New York. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> Paris. Just popping over to Paris yeah, yeah, for the yeah, weekend. Yeah. New York. Changed my watch. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, yeah. And then friends had the calculator ones, which, mm. again, mm, was, I remember that, was popular. A, that was if you're a bit more wealthy. you got. One if you needed to do a sum. They were impossible to press the buttons. And though. how often do you need a sum? Well, exactly. My dad's an accountant, so probably every day. <laughs> but imagine yeah. him going to work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Into a client meeting. Uh, I just Let me just look at my watch for that. <laughs> I just need to get a pin because I can't <laughs> yeah. touch any of the buttons. Um, anyway, we normally start the pod by talking about childhood. Have we so, started? Yeah. Well, oh, yeah. yeah sorry, that's all, all in. in. Oh, is this it? Yeah. So my brilliant anecdotes <laughs> yeah, about watches uh, I don't know. is in. Okay. <laughs> um, so... You're born in Shrew- Shrewsbury, Shrewsbury. I never know how to pronounce it. If it's Shrewsbury or Shrewsbury. I would say Shrewsbury. Is that wrong? Well, it's wrong where I was born. Is so it? So we can solve that, save that conversation. Oh, I was born okay. in Yorkshire. Were you? Okay, Which sorry. you can pronounce inside the Yorkshire or Yorkshire. Yorkshire, Yorkshire, or Yorkshire, 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 yeah. Yorkshire. Okay, so yeah, I, I, born I in found Yorkshire. that out wrong. That's a good start. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost as good as my watch anecdote. Um, so, yeah, so you're born in Yorkshire. What was childhood like then? Childhood was great till I was about... 
10 because I grew up in a little village in the York Dales and I loved it because I could run r- run around and play in the rivers and get really muddy and all that sort of idyllic, bucolic mm. stuff uh, interspersed with a bit of ZX Spectrum action. <sighs> Daily Thompson's decathlon. This is a real nostalgic jet pod, set, isn't it? Jet it comes set, off a lot. Jet yeah. Set Willy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, jet, jet, jet Set Willy. Willy. Man, what was man, that? Manic yeah. Minor. And then back to the beginning. That was an early version of those platform games where you walked along and you moved through levels. Yeah. Um I guess yeah, I guess Mario and stuff was kind of precursor to those. So it was great. And then I guess we we were talking about this a bit earlier, that once you get to an age where um climbing trees doesn't do it for you then it becomes incredibly boring yeah. living in a small village yeah. until you ex- escape to university mm. uh, where I went to Edinburgh for uni oh, um, okay but yeah Such my childhood was just pleasingly good happy and a bit boring so were you an adventurer you know were you an explorer well it sounds like no yeah. no I wasn't really no. I would just play it outside like sorry <laughs> <laughs> open the Perrier <laughs> We're toast to that. <laughs> you played um, outside or not? Yeah, just playing yeah. outside. So playing football or cricket on the road or playing in the river. But it was just playing. It wasn't yeah. adventuring. Mm-hmm. And also I wasn't the sort of crazy guy in the village. It was just what everyone did, riding your bikes around. And then I went to uni. It was only really at uni that I first got interested in adventure. Mm-hmm. And I got into that through three things, really. One, actually, before I went to uni, I spent a year teaching in a little school in Africa which I still think was the best education of my life. And that made me realise, wow, the world is even bigger than Yorkshire. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there, are, there are more people than there are in Yorkshire. This is an exciting place. I want to go see the world, um, like a lot of people at that age. And the second thing was I started really reading a lot of books, travel books, adventure books, expedition books. And that was my real... I was just really binge reading those through uni. And the third thing was... At uni to pay for life, I joined the uh, the territorial army. Basically, okay. I had no interest. I loved the running. I hated the guns part of that. Yeah. yeah. In particular, I hated having to clean the guns, and therefore I tried to never shoot my bullets because then did you know to clean it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I loved the running around the hills, and for the first time in my life, I realised that oh, I'm actually quite good at suffering, having a miserable time, and finding that amusing and persevering through that and for the first time ever I started to find some sort of niche really of mm. oh this is something that I'm kind of good at and there are other people who also enjoy this sort of stuff so that really opened my eyes to a new world um, and that then all of those things combined to getting me curious about trying to do some more adventures. Whereabouts in Africa were you when you went? I was in northern South Africa okay. so a few hours north of Johannesburg Okay, which I still remember as an amazing thing of oh, so I worked in the little market town in Yorkshire called Skipton wearing a uh, a sandwich board I, I did been to Skipton, I did actually. alternate hours in this little shop I had to wear for one hour I'd wear the sandwich board on the street and then we'd switch with another guy and then I'd go in and I was the shop security guard <laughs> for an hour <laughs> brilliant um I got heat exhaustion doing the uh, s- <laughs> doing, doing the sandwich, sandwich board. board had to be rescued by the mar- greengrocer market stall so that wasn't <laughs> My tough this guy. This is all training. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but I remember saving up for the plane ticket to Africa and arriving at Joburg Airport and some person picking us up from this, me and my friend from this little school we we're going to and then just driving for hours and hours and hours and the sky got bigger and bluer and the land got redder and the villages got smaller and poorer, just driving out into Africa. For, um, and I just thought, I was just terrified and thrilled yeah so it was exhilarating yeah, yeah but I just remember that long long straight road and the red dust and the blue sky just thinking wow this morning I was on a plane in Manchester airport and now yeah. I'm in Africa yeah and that's pretty thrilling yeah I imagine so that was really I guess your first yeah your first real taste of how old were you when, when you did that that was um after school so I was 18 to 18 to 19 so that's like an ideal time to do it isn't it when like you're you're ready to kind of see how big the world yeah. is, you're impressionable, you want to do something, you're bored. Mm. It's like an ideal time to then go and do that. Yeah, and I look back with myself, look back at myself now with gratitude that I did that because I wasn't really bold enough or brave enough to really go and do that sort of thing. I mostly got egged on. I wanted to do it, but mostly the reason I did it was I went with a friend who was much braver and more outgoing, sort of guy that would just talk to anyone. So I sort of just tagged onto his coattails and 
off we went together, and it was amazing. Wow, so you almost owe your career to him in a way. I guess so. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's certainly, well, there's all these directions yeah. in life, aren't there, paths, but yeah, certainly that that decision to go there opened up my eyes to wanting to travel more. Because this comes up on the pod quite a lot, where we talk to actors or writers, comedians, that there always seems to be one person at some point, almost like a sliding doors moment, mm. that either encouraged them or like you said, allowed them to kind of like go with them or give them mm. the confidence to do something. Or say people that, who was it that was going to be a dancer and then their dance teacher oh, said, Amanda you, Abington, you yeah, should yeah. do acting. Yeah. And they were really encouraging. And it's just, it's, quite often our life can come down to these moments or one, these influences. Um, and it takes looking back to kind of realise what an impact they can have mm. sometimes. I think the danger with those things is you can often, because you, the impact is strong looking back, you think that they're really big deals. Whereas actually every day in life you're making these choices yes. and decisions yeah. and you don't know which of those are big decisions at the time, do they? Yeah. Do you? You don't know until... So I, I try in my head to just always just try and make the best decision I can right now and go down the route that feels adventurous and makes me curious now and now and now. And some of them will be dead ends, but... You, and you don't know looking back which ones will be until you look back which are going to be big ones but you have to, you have to I, I try and do the same but I find it very difficult and I, I'm always looking back and thinking what if I didn't what if I've done that what if I've done this but every decision you take as you say brings you to this current moment anyway but I do often overthink if I've got decisions that I overthink a lot I think where's this going to go where's this going to go rather than just being okay I'm just going to do it and see what happens mm. do, do, do you find that? yeah yeah I mean there's a colossal weight of on these decisions aren't there and that you've only got one life as far as we know and that in 50 years you'll be dead and how annoying if you choose the wrong path that'd be so you can either let that cripple you yeah. or just plow on and try and make the best you can yeah. that it's quite a cliched thing but I find it a really helpful thing myself is asking my 80 year old myself to advise me what I should do yeah and that takes away the 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 the, the disproportionate baggage of now and then the older person saying, well, I would be glad if you did some adventures, young man. So yeah. go and do that. And don't worry about vacuuming the living room so much. <laughs> <laughs> Although I'm Will very good do, at vacuuming. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Were you starting to do that a little bit back then, though? No. No. Not no, at all. no. Back then, I was just trying to do stuff that was fun. Yeah. Like a lot of young people. And then, and then I, was want, I was restless and wanted to go travel the world like a lot of young people. Mm. So, no, there wasn't much great thought going into my <laughs> into my life at all <laughs> and so you were teaching out there is that yeah. yeah yeah it was this little rural school in um a really poor part of south africa and um and they had they'd somehow built up this link with my school in england that had a couple of volunteers come out so we got board and lodging um a little cottage to stay in and 50 pounds a month salary which we spent entirely on beer <laughs> <laughs> castle lager um and then we just we taught the little kids i had to teach accounting so i was one page okay. of, which i'd never done in my life so i was one page ahead oh, and had like cash <laughs> <laughs> um and then at the weekends i joined the village football team um which was just an amazing thing like this little african village football team um and Home games were on the dusty pitch outside, wow. red dirt pitch, and the away games we'd pile into with these sort of minibus, all pile in, go off, blasting music off to some local match, and I was like the foreign overseas yeah. player, the foreign import. Yeah, yeah. he's yeah. guy. This guy must be good. <laughs> yeah, disappointment. Yeah. <laughs> and then go to the local bar afterwards, and that was just wonderful. Amazing. Mm. I'm a big football fan, and I find football is such a great way of immersing yourself in kind of local culture, meeting people. It's like the one universal language. Yeah. Mm. And it can really help you get to know people you're with. Yeah. Yeah. If you've got a ball, you can play. You don't need any more language. Yeah. It's wonderful. What was your position? But by then, it was as far back in the pitch as possible. I, yeah. my, my illusions... Behind the goal. <laughs> well, not quite. Yeah, that's where I am these days. But I became a lumbering centre half. Right. Yeah, I moulded myself on David Batty. He was my oh okay yeah yeah mentor. yeah. We were saying I was going to say you were a Leeds fan, aren't you? Yeah, we were yeah, saying yeah, I was a Leeds fan. David Batty was who I aspired yeah, yeah. towards. I remember when I got more Twitter followers than David Batty. <laughs> <laughs> he's got about three hundred. So I remember. Well, thinking, he's disappeared, isn't he? Yeah, he's like not doesn't. Every so often I Google him, like you Google your exes. I Google David Batty because <laughs> yeah. there's lots of rumours about yeah. his life. But. Do you look, there's another podcast which we're not affiliated to, but I'm going to recommend it called Quickly Kevin Will He Score, which is a '90s football podcast. 
It's really oh, good. Josh Widdicombe. Josh Widdicombe, yeah. yeah, it's really good. Um, but they always talk, David Batty is the one interview they want to get. And like every oh. season, they're like trying to find out where Batty is. And if they get like Matt Letizia, I'm like, where's Batty? Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. He's just completely shut off oh. from his life. Which I really admire in yeah. many ways. I often dream of Maybe doing that myself. Maybe he's doing similar things to what you do. Yeah. going <gasps> off and having adventures. Maybe he's cycling around I'd love an adventure yeah. with David Batty. <laughs> I think he my that sounds guess, like a Channel 5 program yeah, <laughs> yeah my guess is that my hero worship of him might decline yeah. in his company yeah Never meet there's always heroes. that risk isn't there yeah. that sometimes you shouldn't meet heroes true I mean in my I think doing this podcast meeting heroes has been a good thing but it's been amazing yeah but I think yeah sometimes you know a week know. with David Batty in this is Channel 5 all over <laughs> isn't not, it yeah. it David is a bit Batty partridge Africa, actually isn't yeah. it yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, it's been like Christian Van Gogh and Hostels, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you did that, and then you came back and went to university, um, and that was in Edinburgh. How, how how was that? What were you doing up there? What was it? Was, was Very you little. Su- no, <laughs> well, yeah. university can be like. I look back it? at my time <laughs> at uni with real. Well, this is basically I've just become old because oh the opportunities I had yeah. that I didn't take and <laughs> yeah. oh, what an opportunity that was and I just wasted it I, I mean I had a brilliant time I mucked Much, around yeah, a lot yeah. I played a lot of sport drank a lot of beer and ran up a lot of hills and I very much enjoyed all of those mm. things but well I mean it just in ter- if now if someone would now say to me here you are his, his four years this was in the days before fees as well so yeah, basically yeah. four yeah. free years to do what you want oh, I'd write the great novels and I'd <laughs> do all sorts of useful things but youth is wasted on the young it is it is yeah the one I think the one thing it really did for me though was gave me time to read a lot of books about adventure mm-hmm. run over hills and practice it's the perfect practice the art of suffering yes it is and get me really, really, really restless and impatient to get out into the world. So when I got to the end of my time at uni, I decided by then that I really wanted to go and do a massive bike trip because I think c- cycling combines the um, like the youthful backpacker urge to go to lots of places with the masochistic urge I had of <laughs> being miserable. Yeah, yeah. Plus the com- plus the third asset of it's really cheap. Yeah. yeah. Um, which is useful when you're just out of uni um so i really want to go do that but i kind of had my sensible hat on thinking i'm cut after adventure i have to get a proper job because that's just what everyone does yeah. mm. so i decided that first of all i'd train to be a teacher and once i'd done that then i'd go for my bike ride so i del- did an extra year as a student to become a teacher and then went for my bike ride so you did the, so you did like a pgc yeah you, exactly pgc and, yeah, yeah. And then, but didn't, did you, so you were doing what you were working on the, on the job? Were you, or so the, PGC, you do your training, because my wife's just done. Yeah. Hers, okay. So you do yeah. like normal uni yeah. stuff and then you get placed in schools yeah, yeah. and do that. And I loved it. I yeah. really enjoyed it. And I was good at it, um, which is quite a nice combination to yeah, have. Yeah. And, a, and a teacher salary when you're 23, 24 seems like good money. Or something. Yeah, yeah. Oh, look, I'm yeah. getting, you can get, this is good. And the real big moment in my life was the head, the school I was placed in, the head uh, Henry Box School in Whitney near Oxford. The headmaster there, he asked, he offered me a full time job after I graduated at the school, which is brilliant. I mean, that yeah. was basically what everyone on their PGC aspires to. Yeah, is. of course, yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's not firstly it's the security of a job, but also it's just the the guy who's seeing you teach every week thinks you're good enough to yeah. hire you. It's yeah. like, wow, yeah. this is really good. So he asked me to do that and I sat down and I wrote to him and said thank you this is a very good offer but I'm going to go cycle around the world first and that was my real moment of commitment of turning sort of daydream yeah, and yeah. chat and banter into I'm actually going to go and do this with the assumption that when I came home I would then go, go and be back. a teacher and, but I would well, I wondered if, like, were sort of friends and loved ones are obviously supportive in these moments, but I think sometimes maybe they're a bit like, oh, yeah, like a bit scoffing of it, you know, like, it, I, oh, I believe it when I see it kind of thing. Yeah, very or, much. Yeah. Like, are you sure? Yeah. Yeah, you sure you, you want to do, do that? that? Yeah. 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 Sure, I mean, my parents for sure would have rather I went and became a teacher and yeah. see their son becoming the headmaster in 30 years' time, and they'd be really pleased with that. Yeah. That's, and that would be 
a good life. That would be, you know, it was. It wasn't like I was running away from anything bad. It was mm. perfectly good option in life, and they would have rather I did that. I think uh, my friends, I think, were, were in the realms of. Oh, we'll believe this when we see yeah, it. Yeah. A lot of chat, <laughs> yeah. late night chat. Yeah. Let's. <laughs> See, see what it's put your money where your mouth yeah, exactly. is. But for you, was that a, more of an incentive, though? Well, quite a lot of all of this des- this desire to do a big adventure was definitely that I felt I had a bit of a chip on my shoulder for just feeling a bit mediocre in life and mm-hmm. not being very good. At, I mean, I wasn't. I was just not that good at anything really. It was just normal, mm. and being normal is a bit annoying when you're young. So oh, I just wanted to be good or, or remarkable, I suppose, at something. So it was definitely a chip on the shoulder and a bit of ego. So and sort of just wanted to sort of prove myself. So there was definitely that aspect to it. Um, but there's a very big difference between talking boldly about something, even turning down a job offer, and then actually getting on your bike at your front door with seven grand was my worldly wealth yeah. in my pocket, which really isn't enough to make it around the world, and pedaling off down the road to see what happens. And that moment was really goodbye, graduate life, mm. hello, I have no idea what. what's going to yeah. and, and that, I spectacularly underestimated Did you? the enormity <laughs> of that. <laughs> yeah. So um, what was your, Did you? I guess you had a plan to a certain extent, when at what point did you realise the plan wasn't <laughs> going like <laughs> well like you thought it would? Okay, so two fa- two things. One was pedalling away from my front door taught me for the first time about what I had in my life and had now just chosen to leave behind. So a perfectly good life, a nice job, a lovely girlfriend, nice family. I'd chosen now to leave that behind and therefore, for the first time ever, I appreciated that. Mm. And I found that quite <laughs> a overwhelming. A minute down the road. Yeah, <laughs> literally. It's like, wow, this is a... St- this is a but I wasn't yeah. brave enough to turn around and say, guys, it's been a big mistake because <laughs> yeah. I knew I'd just get teased so yeah. much. Yeah. So I was we keen, all knew that yeah, you would never Exactly. Through, and, yeah. and I would rather cycle through China with a, I don't know, something horrific happening rather than have people go, I told you so. Yeah, yeah. a bloody mindedness had already oh, yeah. Like, entered yeah. Yeah. into it. Yeah. So, th- so the trip began under a cloud of misery, basically. <laughs> and then two, and my plan was to cycle to Australia. And I researched like, how to get through Asia and had my visa for Iran and Pakistan. I was on my way to Afghanistan and on to Australia. And then two weeks into my ride, the September 11th attacks happened. And then the war started in Afghanistan. Yeah. um, Round about when I got to Turkey. And suddenly my lovely scenic ride through Afghanistan didn't seem like such a fun idea anymore. Yeah. So the whole, so that was the second time when the plan just went totally (laughs) all ends up. Um, and I stopped in Istanbul for two weeks in Istanbul just to try and figure out what on earth was happening in the world. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it was a time of total and utter mayhem, really. Um, and uh, the choice, and I had various options of what to do, but the, the resolution of that was I decided to not cycle to Australia and instead to cycle to Cape Town. <laughs> so right. uh, I had to send home all of my Himalayan winter gear buy myself some sun cream and some flip-flops yeah. so to <laughs> cycle to South Africa. Yeah. Uh, but that involved cycling through the Middle East, at this, so through Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, Egypt, at this time that was ex- in the months after September 11th, which is extremely turbulent. I bet that was, yeah, I bet that was felt very, uh, you were isolated as well, so you're on your own. So that must have felt, yeah, very strange. Yeah, you're on your own, you're travelling at 10 miles an hour, you're, you're a very visible and obvious target and I was, and I'd never been to the Middle East before, so all I knew about the Middle East was what I'd read in the Daily Mail, <laughs> which, you know, um, which is not never, the best source. Yeah. <laughs> well, one thing I've since learned really is to pretty much not believe the Daily Mail. Yeah. Full yeah, stop. Yeah. yeah. Life advice. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, I'd never read the Daily. I chose that as a deliberate thing, but basically, yeah, yeah, yeah. everything I'd read in the news in my it was life, a stereotype of yeah. The, yeah, but yeah. also just. You know, you only see bad stuff. So you watch the TV news and my childhood was Israel, Palestine, yeah. and it's all you ever see. No one had, n- I'd never in my life met anyone from those countries growing up in Yorkshire's. So I knew nothing at all. And I was, re- and I thought of myself by then as quite a open-minded liberal guy who was really 
curious about engaging with the world. But I really was amazed as I approached the Lebanon border just how scared I was and therefore how many inbuilt prejudices I had about this region that I didn't know were there mm. at all. So I was terrified as I crossed into the into the Lebanon. Um, the first night, though, so I was cycling along, and usually at night I'd just put up my tent behind a tree and camp and then carry on in the morning. But that night, riding to Lebanon, I was too scared to camp because I thought, oh, some Middle East person's going to kill me. <laughs> and the sun was setting. I thought, oh, when it gets dark, everyone's going to kill me. And I was really nervous. And I, I had so little money, I never factored. Hotels just didn't register in my head. So in the end, I just had to just just take a punt. And I knocked on this farmhouse door. My heart was beating. Wow. And this lady opened the door, and she got a real shot. Like, oh, white guy on a bicycle. This is not what we were expecting. <laughs> yeah. Um, and they ushered me into the house and I went in and they didn't speak a word of English. I didn't speak a word of Arabic, but they just sat me down in front of the TV, brought me a massive feast. Wow. I had a game of chess with this old man. And that night we all lay down on the floor, brought some blankets out. In the morning, they gave me a big bag of oranges and sent me for my way. And oh, I thought, incredible. Oh, yeah. maybe the Middle East isn't too bad. That is all. incredible. And then for the next few months, cycling through the Middle East towards Africa, it was just this daily assault of kindness warmth, welcome, hospitality, people feeding you up, people taking you to their homes. And that the lesson that, that taught me just served me well for the, my, the attitude that I approach the whole world with, which is just assume goodness. Yeah. And that policy worked 10,000 times more than it didn't work. I'm John Prado, The Economist's US editor, and I'm the host of a new podcast about the 2020 elections and the road to power in America. We'll take you through the ideas and the social changes that are shaping politics in what promises to be an exceptional election year. That's Checks and Balance for the global view on democracy in America. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Acast, or your podcast app. Um, so that was a brilliant lesson from that for one night in there. And for the rest of the world, I really, I mostly felt just very welcome, very safe. Um, and I spent four years cycling around the world, constantly thinking, I feel at home here in this country. And yeah, then, that's amazing. And, and at home doing that thing, like, mm. you know, look, finding and discovering new places and all that kind of stuff. Yes, it was a full on exercise in just trust, really, because by and every single day I had to talk to people I'd never met before and try and communicate with them about you know, where to buy food, what direction to go, where to get water conditions ahead, often without any common language at all. Um, oh, so this is before like sat and stuff, isn't it? Or yeah, Google Maps? Yeah, or, so, yeah so I didn't have a phone or a laptop with me. So I'd go to an internet cafe, some of those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'd email home yeah. saying, um, I'm, I'm, I'm in. Cairo, you won't hear from me till I get to Khartoum in Sudan. Probably take about a month. I'll email you then. And wow. off you go. Out into the world. Yeah, off the grid. Yeah. Oh, it sounds like absolute bliss <laughs> to me now. <laughs> and what about um, just general, like, your bike and repairs? And were, were there a lot of stalling moments on the way where you, where you had, you know, sort of technical problems? Yeah. Yeah, I mean... I, mean, inevit- I, I cycled 46,000 miles, so you're going to get quite a few, yeah, yeah, a few punctures, punctures along yeah. the way. Um, but for the first three years, I carried my How to Fix Your Bike book with me. It was okay. only after three years I felt I, I'm, I, know, I now know how yeah. to fix a bike. Early on, so in Romania, along the Danube, my wheel completely broke, and I had to, I'd never made a wheel for like weaving in all the spokes and things with the help of some local shepherd. Um, Amazing. In Sudan, my frame snapped, and I had to find some local bed maker who could weld it back together for me. Um, so there were all sorts of breakages yeah, yeah, yeah. and disasters, which at the time seemed like the end of the world, but actually add to the experience mm. in the long run. Um, I got through three bikes in the whole world. Well, I was going to say, was it a bit like trigger Triggers through? Triggers through, my bad. It was exactly, exactly like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. The, thing. the yeah. thing that survived. <laughs> so what survived a Trigger's broom was um, <laughs> one bottle cage, 
Okay. <laughs> uh, you know, those sort of... Ex- <laughs> I love it. You say, oh, uh, this well, bottle there are, cage... Yeah. <laughs> the bottle, <laughs> so th- there's, only, cause there's only three things made yeah. around the world. The bottle cage... You know that those sort of handlebar extension things. You oh have yeah, like yes, stick yeah. Out. Bar ends. Bar ends. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They made it around the world, and the back rack that carries the panniers. Okay. They made it around the world. Right. Those three things: but the frame, the wheels, everything <laughs> All else. All the important yeah. stuff. <laughs> the everything else went. Yeah. I love. Amazing. I love the idea of these. The kindness you saw around the world, and cause I think, especially at the moment in the current climate, it feels like everyone's attacking each other. But actually, we are so much more in common then we realise, even if you're going to the outer reaches of the world. And I just think that's so, that feels really inspiring and empowering to hear that. Two two small things I remember regularly appreciating on the trip. One, nobody in the world ever refused me water. So that's just a commonality of humans that you need water and basically water ought to be free. So (laughs) everywhere in the world, people gave me water. And the second thing that I loved was there are some things that everyone in the world finds funny. So someone walks down the street, falls over and spills their shopping. Everyone laughs. And I loved that. The thing, like Something silly would happen and some Kazakhstan guy and me would both laugh simultaneously. Yeah. And I loved those brief moments of, oh, geez, we're all just humans. Yeah. Um, and it sounds all a bit, it sort of sounds wishy-washy, but actually is vital and mm. totally misunderstood is that we are on this tiny little planet, which are, is so small, I could get the whole way around it on a bicycle, yeah. and surrounded by billions of miles of empty space, and we should all be nice to each other. Yeah. We s- sat, I think the fact that that sounds like hippie, wishy-washy nonsense is really bad, because yeah. it's what we completely need at the moment, isn't it? Agreed, and it got that kindness got you around the world. Mm. So it's not wishy-washy, it's actually imperative to our survival and your survival on this trip. Yeah, and another thing I enjoyed about that trip now is when I see on the news something like, there's a terrible forest fire in Bolivia, uh, rather than just thinking, oh, that's far away, never mind, at least it's not here, I think, oh, I cycled through Bolivia, and that's a nice place, and these nice people, and it's made me, it gave me a lot more empathy for far off places yeah well it brings also bring brought the world back to your doorstep which actually i think mm. at the moment doesn't happen a lot yeah, you're right yeah, i mean yeah. you think of the, the fires in australia which are still burning now i think a lot of people see it on twitter and think oh never mind but um, actually it's it's changing that country forever mm, actually yeah. and and these are yeah. things that if it affects them then it does affect us but we do the news is skewed to actually only show us stuff that's literally outside our door rather than this massive stuff that does matter have you read a book called the uninhabitable earth no. no, I've heard of it. But okay. Well, if you can just Google it and read the first chapter online, that will completely depress you for the rest of the day. <laughs> so I highly, <laughs> okay. I highly recommend. I'll, I'll you wait. Read I'll it. save that. Yeah, <laughs> I'm in a really good mood. Yeah, that will completely ruin <laughs> yeah. your day. But I think it's one of the most vital books I've read in a long time. It's a climate change book, but it's mm, yeah. the most alarming, shocking thing I've read in a long time. Mm, let's check that out. Yeah, we'll do. <laughs> when I'm in a better place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> so did you get like press coverage and stuff when you were doing your trip? Because if I was a local reporter in Yorkshire, I'd have been all over that. Massive. So the Yorkshire Evening Herald was... Yorkshire Post. Post, that's yeah. right. Yeah. 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 It's interesting you specify the locality because big, big, on the big scale, no. No one knew what I was doing. I, I had a little blog and a mailing list of friends but I didn't have any sponsors I didn't have any media commitments I was skint but I was free yeah, um, yeah. although at the time the I would have preferred not to be in that situation <laughs> yeah. but what I did do was whenever I got to a town of d- any sort of size I would find the local newspaper because they're always desperate for news 100% go there and say hi I've just cycled to your country from England it's taken me what, one two three four years and they'd it's just an easy story for them on a Tuesday afternoon. So I'd, they'd interview me, write some little story, comes out in the paper the next day. I cut it out. And then the brilliant thing then is you've then got explanation of your story in their local yeah, language. Yeah. Yes. You've been in the paper, so you're interesting. You've been in the paper, therefore you're famous. So now this newspaper clipping is a really useful thing as you cycle through the country and people are talking to you but you can't explain. As you just show them the newspaper yeah. cutting. Brilliant. Yeah. So my, I got off the ferry into China from Japan, and I've no idea how it happened because I hadn't set it up. But there was a journalist waiting for me, and I had no idea how they knew. Anyway, so this person interviewed me, and she wrote something of which I couldn't read a word the next day. But there's a like Chinese writing and a picture of me. I cut it out, and I cycle off into China, 
And China felt like one of the most foreign places I've ever been. Once you get out of Beijing, which is Starbucks and McDonald's, after that, your pr- rural China was properly a world where I couldn't read a word yeah. and people couldn't speak a word of my language nor read a word of my script. I felt like a complete alien in rural China. It really surprised me. So I just showed them this article and I have no idea what it said, but without fail, it would make them laugh and then they'd bring <laughs> me some food. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I got like little truckers cafes throughout China. I just get noodles. Have you and, found out what it says now? No, I, sh- no. Oh, I wish I'd kept, no, I'm yeah. kept it. That. Oh. Um, also in China, I, I started a really good idea for traveling, which is in the back of my diary. I had two columns, one with a smiley face and one with a sad face. And when I had some food that I really liked, I'd get them to write it in the smiley column. And when I had something disgusting, I'd write it, get them to, someone to, not the chef, to write <laughs> it in the other. <laughs> yeah. So I just showed them this newspaper article, they'd laugh, and then I'd show them my column. Amazing. And people would start to want to get onto the smiley column. So just the sort of feasts <gasps> oh, and They're bringing you all this amazing food. And Chinese food. Oh, I love oh, yeah, it anyway. Love Chinese food, yeah, yeah. That Amazing. is so, so that's such a good, a good little good hack. hack. Yeah, exactly. That so, what, what so were well. the interviews like? Because I'm guessing when you're going to these local papers and stuff, they can't speak English. They, they usually can, actually. So really? usually my saviours around the world were usually um, the local teacher, the local priest or vicar, um, and the local journalist, so it's someone who's got a bit more education for trying to be able to communicate a bit. Fantastic. I just yeah. love this idea that you're meeting all these people you'd never meet and they're helping you this random well I was going to say what was the reception generally from people did they think you were mad did they you know do you know what I mean was was there a yeah you know obviously you've said that you know trying to help you along the way but was there kind of uh, you know scepticism to what you Uh, you were doing um it was often a bit of confusion and it was interesting I'd often say or you sort of acting you get quite good at miming yeah. and acting so I'd sort of say to people oh I've cycled here from England and go oh whatever yeah. and then I'd say oh now I'm going to cycle to um, Lima or to Nairobi and then they go well you can't go there that's, that's like 300 miles it's impossible <laughs> yeah I've been riding for two years. <laughs> yeah, people, yeah. That, that washed over them, but the prospect of cycling to the next town <laughs> blows people's minds. Yeah. <laughs> for example, if if someone had walked here from Australia to here, and then you, they say, oh, I'm going to walk to Leeds, and people go, what, you can't walk to Leeds? It's really far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's what people know in yeah, their lives. Yeah, yeah. So there's often that. There was very much, I mean, I just had to suck it up that it was the same questions I got all the time. And I just had to accept that this is just part of the deal. They've never met me before, so of course they're going to ask me, bum, 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 bum. And the mood I was in on the day would determine how enthusiastically I answered that. Um, Which I'm guessing were, why? Yeah, yeah. Why? The main one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How? Why are you doing it? How are you doing it? Where do you sleep at night? Isn't it dangerous? How do you pay for it? Yeah. Um, all that sort of, yeah, things like that. Um, and then... Um, yeah, just curiosity. I mean, most mm. people's lives, mine included, most of the time are pretty routine and a bit boring. Yeah. And if suddenly someone cycles into your village who looks totally different to you, yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Um, what I, one of the reasons I did the trip was because I, I found Britain boring and I wanted to go to far off, exciting parts of the world. But the interesting thing is that you're by taking yourself. The further you go away from home, the more you become an exotic specimen. Yeah. Whereas the places you're in are just normal. Like some guy in a little village in um, Azerbaijan is just living their normal life. Mm. But for me, it's like, wow, it's a village in Azerbaijan. Yeah, this is yeah. amazing. Yeah. So when I arrive, he'd be like, this is a guy from England yeah. on a bicycle. <laughs> Do you know the Beatles, and David Beckham, <laughs> the Lady Queen. Diana? Um, so, yeah, you, you become an exotic specimen yourself, which, of course... Very, very occasionally puts you at an element of risk, but most often yeah. just makes you a curiosity and therefore people brings out the best in people yeah, and yeah. communities. Well, um, could, you, could, could you do it now? Could someone, could someone do it now? What? Cycle around the world. Lots of people way. are doing it right now. Yeah. yeah Is I it mean, e- would it be easier, actually, with Google Maps and stuff? Or yeah, it's, I mean, it's become... as much. <laughs> yeah, it's become, in a way... So, you know... Well, X years ago, if someone did the marathon in the office, they were like the crazy guy. Whereas now yeah. everyone does the marathon yeah. and it's yeah. the Ironman. So yeah. back in those days, <laughs> early 2000s, people, a lot of people went backpacking. 
and the people cycling me were the crazy ones. But now there's lo- if you uh, Instagram's full of, of people course. cycling around yeah. the world, and of course they're do- documenting it in a far more beautiful way GoPros than stuff. I did. Yeah, yeah, GoPros and drones. There's loads of people cycling around drones. the world, yeah. and there's open source mapping for the whole world, and there's um, like um, sort of places where you can sleep as cyclists, like um, open house oh, cycling wow. kind of websites. Yeah, there's a whole world of people cycling around the world. But there now. was a, there was more of an inno- innocence when you were doing it, wasn't there? Oh, but there's, you know, you, I think we just you can chunter about the past forever, can't you? <laughs> I'm reading a book at the moment, which is ordinary people's diaries in the months after the Second World War. So it's totally random people, like some housewife, some accountant, and what just talking about daily life. Um, and what I found fascinating about that is the things they chunter about are exactly the same things we chunter about now. That's really brought that home to me. So yeah, when I cycle around the world. Um, I still have, I could go to an internet cafe, for example. Yeah. I could use a ATM. Yeah. So compared to doing it 50 years ago, the first guy to cycle around the world was someone called Thomas Stevens, and he did it on a penny farthing. So that's doing it properly. <laughs> oh, my God, amazing. And when he got to China, in little villages in China, people thought it was an iron horse, and they'd bring out hay to feed his horse. <laughs> wow. Oh, right. And he had a revolver, and he said, most days I Get found something to shoot at. <laughs> So yeah. really, yeah, his book's good. So yeah, so I mean, geez, I'm j- I was just a a 2001 hipster <laughs> <laughs> before <laughs> phone before mobile phones were invented. I just remembered as well. This comes from a previous podcast. Um, I years ago I heard a story about someone that cycled around the world, and now I'm wondering if it was you. But when they got back to England, they came back to Portsmouth, and Portsmouth was at their welcome back party. And after five minutes, their bike got stolen. So that wasn't me, but that was the patron saint of round the world cyclists, a guy called Hein Stucker, who has been cycling around the world nonstop for 40 years. And so that's a true story? Yeah. <gasps> oh, my God, it's true. And the sun, I think, rescued it. This, you know, the sun, when the sun does good things. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Let's get back his yeah, bike. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. I thought that was an urban myth. No. <laughs> so he, but he, Hein Stucker, 40 years on the bike, he was one inspiration to me for stopping the trip because by the end of the trip I'd got to this point where the Guardian would let me write one article a year for 300 pounds I could write maybe one or two other articles for 300 pounds that basically all you need to cycle around the world forever yeah. I was earning a grand a year that's all you need or something yeah and I realized after cycling through 60 countries not how much I'd seen but how little I'd seen and that really I could just cycle around the world forever yeah. And think, but it was Hein thinking about Heinz Stucker, who was who was about sixty at that time, made me think: Do I want to keep doing this, or perhaps the bigger adventure is to stop and then see what comes next? And it, yeah, thinking about him made me think: oh, There is more to life than. Well, I was going to say, was there? Um, yeah, I know you've talked about um, being miserable, and I was most like, you know, obviously this podcast is about blank moments and. Were there were there times though when you felt properly miserable and thought I just go to the local airport and jump on a tra- on a plane and come yeah home? for about the first two years of the ride I was pretty low in terms of thinking I can't finish this so for mm. about two years because after two years I still wasn't even halfway wow. so it's quite hard to have a project that with the end so far off particularly one that is literally seven days a week twenty four hour commitment. It yeah. was literally everything I was doing every minute of every day was on that. So I was out of my depth and pretty overwhelmed for about two years. But it was really the first year when I was properly miserable and properly trying to prove myself to other people. Yeah. The second year, I was less miserable and mostly just trying to prove myself to myself and slightly frustrated how hard I was finding it. Like, come on, I should be doing tougher than this. Mm. And after the second year, I kind of got over that and then I sort of cheered up for the next two and a bit years um, but in terms of there were a few times I came very close to quitting one the first was in Damascus in Syria when I just checked into this proper little flea pit by the bus station sort of one dollar a night kind of place and just cried my eyes out for two or three days because it had taken me four months to get to Syria it's quite a long bike ride but if you look on a world map it's just a yeah. tiny different distance yeah. From England to and Syria. I guess you keep reflecting back on the map. Thinking, yeah. Oh, yeah. Look, here, where am I? And like you say, you've gone, oh, I've only gone like four millimetres. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's taken me all this So time. I felt yeah. totally out of my depth then. Yeah. Next time, well, and then I had various ones along the way, but getting to the end of Cape Town. So when I saw, I'd saw from England to Cape Town, I felt, wow, I've really done something big here. 
what is the is is it worth continuing the sort of law of diminishing returns mm. like when you cycle across one continent you're inevitably going to get less out of the experience of continent number two but I kept going and then at the end of Colombia so South America I decided right this is enough I'm I've cycled all the way up South America I'm definitely going to quit now and I was happy with that I'm going to quit but first of all I need to just go to the ocean and take my end of continent photograph and then I'm going to go to the travel agent and go home and I was set on that so I walked to this the end the ocean which happened to be at the local um, yacht club that's how you could get to the ocean I walked down the jetty put my bike there took a picture and I walked back down the jetty and this American guy on a yacht just shouted out to me hey are you looking for a ride to Panama and I said yeah I guess I am <laughs> yeah. and off I went and that was pretty much the last full on near quitting moment wow yeah I can't remember what your question was <laughs> well no it was just about those dark, you know getting through those kind mm. of those more bleaker moments um yeah, I think when you, the, when you are on the verge of yeah. give, chucking it in. So one know. of the things that used to keep me going was I'd ask myself a question of, have I got? Is there a better option in my life? Is there a, something I can do that is more rewarding, adventurous, interesting, leading in interesting pathways than this? And if there is, then I should go and do it. I didn't want to be handcuffed to this journey just because I'd said I'm going to cycle around the world. I didn't want. Getting to the end was not the point for me. It wasn't. I didn't want to be shackled to it. And therefore, if I could think of a better thing to do with my life, I should go and do that. But until I could think of that better thing, then I should keep going with what I was doing because I knew that although it was tough, I kind of felt in the long run it would probably be worth it. And I never did think of that more interesting thing. So I just, <laughs> so I just kept on going. Until, like you say, nearer the... Well, when you sort of completed it, then you were starting to think, actually... What other things can mm, I be doing? Yeah, and there have been other periods in my life since then when the way that I've been doing things of, right, this is what an adventurous life means to me, bum, 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 start to not feel valid anymore. And then the slow acknowledgement that, oh, actually, I should change direction in my life. So trying to trying to be determined but not dogmatic yeah. about a direction, I find quite a hard balance to get. I think as well, I think, Sort of getting on a bike is quite a good analogy for getting through difficult moments. And I want to talk about going to the gym now, which may sound like a tangent, but it's not. But like, I go to the gym sometimes as a personal trainer, and there not, are some not, not very often. <laughs> <laughs> Should have put the kind of long sleeve <laughs> shirt on. Um, there are some things he makes me do that that like it's really all in hurt. The legs, isn't it, Jim? It's all in the legs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If I got, uh, see my thighs, he'd be well impressed. Money, money well spent. Um, there are some things he makes me do where I can't. You, you do whatever, push-ups or something, and then you get to a point where you can't do it anymore, and you physically cannot push that bar anymore. But there are other things he gets me to do that hurt, but for some reason I can just keep doing it, and it still hurts, but I can keep doing it. And I think a, being on a bike is kind of similar to that, because no matter how things, much things hurt or how difficult it feels, you can still get on that bike, and you can still pedal, and you're never going to be able to not pedal. And as an analogy for kind of getting through difficult mm. moments, it's like, just, just get back on your bike. Because you can, yeah. it's a really simple thing. You can do it, and it's going to take you forward. Wow, this analogy really works, and um, you're going to feel like you're progressing and going somewhere. Right, yeah. I've, I've smashed it. Yeah, <laughs> nice. I, but it was very valid for me because if I thought about right, I've got f- all I've got to do is ride for four years, then I'll succeed at this thing. That just my head doesn't work in that way. Mm. It would just depress me. And so the, the notion of just right, I'll just get to the end of this consonant, and then we'll debate quitting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sometimes that was too far. So I said, right, we'll get to the we'll get to the next airport, and then we'll discuss, or next week, or quite often it was just get to get to sunset, put up the tent. Yeah, and then once you put up the tent, you go to sleep, you wake up in the morning, feel a bit better, and also sitting around in your tent all day in the middle of the bush is boring. So yeah. however low I was feeling, oh well, I, I might as well just pack up my tent, get on the bike, and start. And then once you begin, you're like, oh well, I'm yeah. off, and another day happens. So yeah. it was ver- people often come up to me after talks and things and say and they want to share their experience of a bike trip they've been on and people say oh it was nothing like what you did but I once did and I all and that's it's they're being sort of polite I suppose or Mm. humble or something but I always stress that if you've ridden your bike for a weekend or a week you know exactly what it feels like to cycle around the world because you've had that physical tiredness you've had a bit of mental lows you've learned how to put up your tent it's exactly the same thing it's just all I had to do is just repeat it 1500 times yeah and you get to the end yeah and actually that comes on to the good point of the the, mi- the micro adventures 
that you, you came up with, which I guess is the same thing. People can experience these crazy things that you've done, but in their own kind of way. And I guess maybe sort of takes them away from their lives and, you know, the, the things that might be getting them down and almost like a sort of hitting F5, like a refresh button. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I, um, I so after that bike trip, I spent mm. quite a few years doing other big expeditions. I was basically trying to become Ranulph Fiennes, what I was tr- <laughs> trying to do. Um, but a few things were starting to go in, no, fizzle, fizzle through my head. One of which well, one of which is that I got married, had a kid, and suddenly the prospect of disappearing for four years is not an option anymore. Yeah, yeah. So it's a question of how can I live adventurously, but with this reality, this new constraint in my life, and also noticing that People come to my talks, people read the books I was starting to write or the blogs I was doing. Lots of people like adventure, but not many people are doing it. Mm. Why? And the answer often is, well, real life. I haven't got time, mate. I haven't got time to cycle around the world because I've got a job. (laughs) I'm an accountant. Look at my watch. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I started trying to think of the stuff that I'd loved about adventure, the freedom, the challenge, the physical challenge, the mental challenge, the being outdoors, the... um, disconnecting from the busy world, um, all of the stuff that I loved about adventure, could I find that close to home? Um, and of course, you get more adventure by cycling around the world, but if the option is do absolutely nothing or cycle around the world, then, then there must be something else. So Ooh, yeah. then the, the better option is do I do absolutely nothing or do I cycle to my local hill, camp for the night and cycle back home at dawn to be back home for when the family wake up? Suddenly that's, ah, oh, that's, that's getting... 80% of the benefits of cycling around the world, but yeah. without leading to uh, getting divorced and yeah, family yeah. disaster. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. that, which of course is f- applicable to so many people. So I started thinking about the adventures I'd liked and seeing how they could fit around people's constraints of not much time, not much money, living in a city rather than in the highlands of Scotland, not having all the fancy gear that you might need, the the feeling that I don't belong in this adventurous world because I'm an accountant. So this, the, all these things that stop people having adventures. I was trying to find small solutions to those, which I called micro-adventures. Um, and the smaller and smaller I made them, the more and more they resonated. Yeah. Uh, remove the barriers, remove the obstacles until all that's left is the excuses, really. <laughs> and at some point, you have to just... I have to say, well, I can't make it any smaller. So time to go look in the mirror and have <laughs> yeah, a word with yeah. yourself because you really have got the time and the money to do this if you choose to do it. I think we can all benefit from that. I think everyone, people listening, I'd imagine, hopefully, would love an escape uh, as, as micro as possible mm. or, or whatever scale works for them. And I think we all feel better for it. Yeah, well, I've... And so carrying on these micro ventures, I've been getting them smaller and smaller and smaller over the years and... So last year, for example, my challenge to myself was a monthly tree climb. So my Google calendar on the first Tuesday of every month pings at me, go climb a tree. So I turn off my email, go to this tree near my house, climb it, take a picture of myself up there, have a cup of tea. What, up the tree? Yeah, take a flask of tea up there <laughs> for 10, 15 minutes, yeah. come back down the tree, back to my desk, back to the emails. And the first time I did it, I thought, oh, that was fun. But I found myself looking forward to the next month. And the next month I got there nature moved on a little bit in a month yeah. and I climbed the tree and I thought back about how my last month had been and I thought a little bit about the next month ahead came back down the tree back to my emails and I found myself starting to really look forward to this probably a 40 minute total activity and I kept going every month last year and I'm repeating it again this year and I found that to be such a rewarding fun satisfying tiny tiny lunchtime adventure that's amazing. Yeah, it's great. I'm trying to think of any trees near me, though. When did you last climb a tree? I've never climbed a tree. What? Yeah. I'll tell you why, though, because when I was talking about local news earlier, I used to be a local reporter down in Uckfield, and then I moved to Seven Oaks, and I did a story in Seven Oaks once about a 10-year-old boy who climbed a tree at the local somewhere um, and got stuck up the top of it, and he couldn't come down. <laughs> he was too scared to come down. So they had to get the fire, news. the fire crew out, and the fire crew were like, getting him down. I only found out because the mum had written a letter to the paper saying, can you please thank the fireman that got my kid out of the tree? And I was like, well, what is the story? This is great. Did we did a whole double page spread on it. Um, <laughs> but ever since then, I think I've probably been a bit, because um, I was a local reporter, so I just like desperate for news, a bit scared about climbing a tree because what if I end up being a 10-year-old boy who can't get down? What, now you mean? Yeah. 
<laughs> being, being the 35 year old man so yeah who goes to the gym where it does nothing <laughs> yeah <laughs> how high is the tree well it's a Roughly. big old oak tree yeah. but I climb fairly high what I climbed is to this point where the final st- this is quite easy and then the final bit is a step of faith that scares me okay. every month and I like that because yeah. it means that even in a busy month when I'm just at a computer writing a book I have at least one second of terror yeah. in that month which is <laughs> a good, a good yeah. thing to have in your life it so, keeps you alive yeah yeah. Um, yeah and I love just last year I noticed the seasons more than I'd ever done before because I was just dipping in and yeah. concentrating really hard in that time it's good and it's a chance for you really to are you, I mean I assume you're good in your own company Yes, a lot of the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because not everybody is. Um, no, I'm. So I, I would have preferred to cycle around the world with a friend, because I was a bit scared when I set off, and it was a bit yeah. daunting, and it's a bit lonely. And the first times you put up your tent on your own is terrifying. You think you're going to get murdered. I was going to say, did you ask anyone before you set out? Usually not. No, <laughs> normally I just camp behind a tree and stuff. No, I meant like start when oh, you start. The, yeah, 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 yeah. Please come on this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's going to take about four years. Yeah, but, like, yeah, exactly. We might get murdered, but yeah. we might not. Yeah. yeah, so there were a few friends yeah. I tried to persuade. But, you know, I'm pretty sure we'd have just got, had a bust up or yeah, gone our own yeah. way. So yeah. I'm actually really glad that I did it by myself. And I often suggest that people who are talking about going off on their own travels that if you if you don't dare do it, then go with a friend because it's great yeah. and it's fun. You'll have a happy time. But if you can dare, if you can be brave enough, then go do something by yourself, even if it's just a weekend or something. Because it's a very rare experience these days to be totally immersed in your own company, yeah. inside your head. <laughs> yeah. um, and especially if you can force yourself to go somewhere with no... A phone signal yeah, exactly. you yeah, have yeah, to yeah, actually phone, yeah. just find entertainment within your head and in the surroundings that's an unusual thing to do yeah, yeah. well it is no, it's something we sort of alluded to on the, um, the last podcast I think is that just like I said I think I was saying that I was like queuing up in the post office and even there go, oh I'm having to stand around for a minute and think mm. oh I'll get my phone out and see what's yeah. on the phone and we don't allow ourselves to be bored anymore I have actually r- just settle and have a little mm. think inside yeah. our heads that often. I have to set myself lots of rules in life. Mm. And one of my rules is when I'm waiting for the tube um, or a train on a platform, I'm not allowed to get my phone out. And more than that, I try to make myself stand still. Yeah. It's really hard to do, even for two minutes. And if suddenly you have to wait, stay for three or four minutes, you start to think, everyone must be looking at me. I must be the biggest weirdo in town. <laughs> and you think your head's going to explode. And think, wow. If so you won't move like out of people's ways. Oh no, past. no! Like when is it? Yeah, <laughs> I never do no, that. No, yeah. The human statue. <laughs> yeah. If you start putting coins down, <laughs> they'll yeah. move. Yeah. But I think just yeah. Yeah, spending. What is it? some old philosopher said that human races' problems come from being unable to spend time with yourself in an empty room. Yeah, yeah. So go for a bike ride or climb a tree. Or yeah, well, because there are so many distractions, aren't there? Phones mm. and not just that, all sorts of things around us. Like it's very easy to put off being on your own uh, because there's so much other stuff to do. But yeah, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go find a tree. I think. And do we see? Do you think we can find one? Should we try? And, <laughs> well, we've got a meeting. I don't think there's many around here. No. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the thing as well. But you know, there would be people listening that might think I want to climb a tree, but live in a city and stuff. But I guess there probably are equivalent tree equivalents or other places yeah. you can go to where you're just on your own or you're giving yourself that little and I think being out in in the you know in the natural world as well not just going to a climbing wall somewhere Mm. actually going out and I mean I'm really lucky that I live by the coast right on the South Downs I often go for walks down to the all down to the rock pools and all that kind of stuff where you just can soak in the natural world a little bit and that is makes such a difference Mm. but I think even in a city you can get some you can fuel your curiosity, which I think is one of the most vital things in life. But you know, things like walking in a random route to get to somewhere, yeah. or um, you s- walking to the horizon is quite a fun thing to do in a city because usually it's tiny, but it'll be oh look, there's a church spire, mm. and it's only three blocks away. But just the process of saying right, that's my mission to get to there. I mean, yeah. It's a pointless thing to do, but it's what you see along the way. Yeah, it's the same most adventures I do. Like well, I'm going to go from there to there in the most miserable way I can. Is inherently pointless but it's just force it's a reason to force you out the door and do things which along the way are interesting yeah Um, and those adventures are out there aren't they 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 are there and available it's almost like getting your head up from the phone 
and looking around and finding something yeah. to focus on and do it. And that in turn will give you that kind of respite from everything, a mm. little bit of peace mm. maybe. And even yeah. if it is only half an hour, 40 minutes, that can have a massive impact on, on your day. When I started doing micro adventures, I was a bit nervous about it because I was just getting established as a sort of proper adventurer. And I was just about starting to make a living from doing proper stuff. And I really worried about, now I'm just going to go sleep on some hill in Surrey or I'm going to go and walk a river in Hertfordshire or something. Will anyone care? This is this sounds wimpish and not very macho. And it just has it resonated so much more. Mm. No one cares about some guy rowing the ocean. It's stupid. <laughs> but um, <laughs> these things that are local yeah. and can actually impact your life are far m- more relevant to people. And yeah. actually in many ways more interesting. So, yeah, when I started doing microadventure, I had no idea that would basically become my adventure mission well it'd be quite nice maybe we could challenge our listeners to do their own micro adventures yeah, and then tweet us and yeah. let us know what they've done send us a photo or something and tell us how you created your own micro adventure let yeah. us know if they need rescuing <laughs> yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. It will come, come stuck up a tree <laughs> yeah. now i want to ask you about because you did um a desert race all right and you am i right in saying that you broke your foot while you were doing it yeah well a how did you break your foot and Obviously, that impaired the rest of, the, rest of the, uh, the the race for you. Yeah, so it was a race called the Marathon des Sables, which yeah. is, uh, sort of pops up on the news on quiet days. It's the bill as the toughest race in the world. I think it would be now more appropriately billed as the most expensive race in the world <laughs> okay. because there are lots of equivalents, these sort of ultra yeah, marathons. Sure, yeah. um, 150 miles through the Sahara. And I really enjoyed it because it was... I'd been in deserts before, but now I was in a desert am- amongst 800 other people with blasting French soft rock music and a TV <laughs> helicopter. And I found that the camaraderie of it yeah. thrilling. And the, on the penultimate day, I stepped awkwardly on a rock and broke my metatarsal footballer. footballer oh, the yeah. David Beckham injury. Very yeah. painful. So I could just hobble on. So I hobbled on towards the finish line. But by then, what's great about that race is that it's really not that interesting that someone with a broken foot finishes the race because everyone's in total bits like yeah. blisters and chafing and agony yeah. and so it's just like yeah join join the rest of us and that's something i really enjoyed about that was seeing other people who are what an agony yeah exactly <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I, f- I, I found my tribe of yeah. similar idiots yeah. <laughs> mm. that's amazing yeah yeah Oh. Okay, well, I'm looking at the time. It's probably time to wrap up mm. the pod. And we've actually, throughout this, it's been a fascinating chat. And we've, we've stumbled over blank moments and stuff like that already. Um, I, I think I probably know what you're going to say, but we normally ask our guests at the end for their advice on blank moments for anyone listening. So have you got anything to impart to our listeners? Um, I, I think something that's really helped me was belatedly realizing that the way that I thought I ought to live my life when I was, say, in my early 20s and formulating my rules of an adventurous life, those rules don't have to stand, they don't have to stand when you're 32 or 42 or 52 and allowing change into my life and allowing lulls into my life, times when I'm not barreling on at 100 miles an hour is fine. And to slow down, to allow myself to slow down, to allow myself to change direction and then to gradually get some energy from somewhere and begin again. I think that's been quite helpful for me. Yeah, you're not stuck to this one path. Yeah. Because I have the power to change it. I spent my early 20s reading books about crazy men and women doing crazy stuff. And I sort of set, that is the life I want. And off I went. It was brilliant for about 10 years. And then I got married and I had kids. And suddenly this this monomaniacal, ambitious, macho, tough guy route in life just kind of leads to disaster when you're also trying to live a normal, humane life that's not just all about you. And it took me quite a few years of those things tugging very awkwardly at each other before I thought, oh, actually, I don't have to be Ronald Fiennes anymore. I can just be the guy who goes to climb a tree in my lunch break and be much happier for doing so. Fantastic. Now, we can't stop the pod without... um, Oh, yes. Without alluding to the fact that there's a violin in it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> T- tell us quickly about what, what, what's the violin for. So, <laughs> well, obviously for yeah. playing. But yeah, well, it leads on from that question, yeah. that last answer, actually, which was I spent years thinking that living adventurously meant doing that sort of stuff. But I'd been doing expeditions for about 20 years by this point, so I'm pretty good at cycling along the way and camping and stuff. 
And I realized that a lot of what I wanted from life or from adventure was the uncertainty and the risk and the not knowing and the fear of failure, but the excitement of maybe making it. All these sort of unknowns had kind of gone because I was just good at this stuff. I, so in, although I was on a tent up a mountain, in my own way, I was just in a rut and a comfort zone. Yeah. And so to keep living adventurously, I needed to take a very different view of what adventure meant. So how could I get back into my life this uncertainty, the fear of failure, the risk, the unknowing, the the terror? I thought, I know, I should go and busk across Spain <laughs> because <laughs> I have zero musical skill. You know, if I had to stand up and sing a song, that's my idea of terror. I would just run away. I can't do any music. I've never bust. The thought of having to stand in a town with people looking at me is mortifying and humiliating. So I spent a few months learning the violin and then I spent a month walking through Spain with no money, no wallet, only my violin. Okay. Day one was, so I arrived in Spain and I had some cash because I'd flown on a plane. I stayed in the Airbnb and then that first morning I walked out and I emptied my pockets of the final coins. I left them on this park bench and I walked off into the town and for the first time in my life I had no money. And I found that such a vulnerable feeling to have no money. And so I got my, I had to go and busk if I wanted to get some. And I just walked around town for a few hours, just too scared to play. And eventually I just had to say, come on, you've got to do this. So I set up my violin in this little plaza. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Again, I've told everyone I'm going to do this trip. If I fail on day one, that's just so humiliating. I've got to eat. I've got to do this somehow. So I set up the violin (laughs) and I realized then that I was the most afraid I'd felt since the day I set off to row across the Atlantic Ocean. And I found that fascinating because rowing the ocean is quite a scary thing to do for valid reasons. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) What was I scared of here? I was like scared of what would people think? What if people laugh at me? What? People like me aren't supposed to be doing stuff like this. I should be at home with a yeah, spreadsheet. A pu- it's a public failure. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. Yeah. I'm in my 30s. I shouldn't. Be, I should be doing something sensible with my life. So all yeah. of these, the things that society puts on us were terrifying me. So I stood there and I started to play, and it was just well. I mean, if you've never, I'd been learning for a few months, but I was awful, and it was just humiliating. What can I ask? Why the violin as opposed to something like the guitar? So. Or, I mean, My favourite travel book that I read back as a student was called As I Walked Out One Midsummer Morning by Laurie Lee, who in the 30s played his violin okay. through Spain. Oh, um, so it's a bit of an OT. Retracing his trip. And it was a trip I'd wanted to do for 15 years, but I'd put off because I'm not musical and it was too scary. And therefore I couldn't do it. And fast forward, that was the exact reason why I chose to do it. it yeah. And the violin is famously nightmarishly <laughs> difficult to yeah. learn. Yeah. Um, but to summarise it, I did it. I made it from, for a whole month from Vigo to Madrid, 500 miles, funded entirely by my busking. Amazing. So I had to walk 500 miles, I had to camp out every night, cook on fires. But those things were the easy things for me. That's yeah. what I've been doing all my life. But every day I had to get in some little village plaza, get out my violin <laughs> and play. And that was terrifying. Did it ever get easier for you? It did, yeah, yeah, definitely. But I had a rule to myself that whenever I earned money, I had to spend all of it immediately. So so that the next day I'd be zero again. Okay. I'd again. It's like Brewster's Millions. Back to bust. <laughs> Boom or bust. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. But you, you so, must have been a half decent because people were giving you money. So I earned, in a whole month, I earned 120 euros, which was way, way more than I thought I would earn. I lived really? like a king. But one day... A sort of glory day of life, a sunny Sunday morning. In two hours, I earned 20 euros in one town. Wow. I bought ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> it was just decadence and glory. I've earned this ice cream. Yeah. Oh. But so the rest of the month was sort of bread and bananas. So that first time, when you got it out, and you started um, bowing, what, what was the reaction? People... Well, mostly people ignore Quizical. you. Because yeah. most yeah. of all, you yeah. think the whole world cares about me. Like, yeah. oh, I'm wearing matching. My T-shirt doesn't match today. Everyone's going to care. No one cares. No it's one the, cares. the spotlight syndrome, isn't it? Yeah, we think the mm. world cares about us. They don't. Yeah. So most people just walk on. Some people would sort of wince a bit at me playing. Some people would <laughs> chuckle. Some people would just sort of look like I was a weirdo or look at their phone. But actually, yeah. a lot of certain age groups don't even notice they're on their phones. Yeah, yeah. But mostly people ignored me or just passed on by with a day and I felt just ignored 
or slightly laughed at, but not in a bad way, actually. No one, no one was unkind, really. It was just ignoring me. Um, and, but the crew, you know, I played for a few hours, didn't earn a penny, and I was just really thinking this is... It was a nice idea, quite funny, well done. But thinking of retracing your steps back to the bench. You'd put yeah, exactly. Where <laughs> yeah. are those coins? Yeah. Still there. Yeah. Um, and getting the console to evacuate me. <laughs> yeah. But eventually I earned a coin. And that was just a, such a thrilling, thrilling moment of joy and relief and amusement and justification. And you know, once you've done it once, you think, wow, I've done it once. Yeah. I can do it again. And from then on, it was just one of the most glorious adventures I've ever done in my whole life. And it was nothing to do with the adventure stuff. It was all to do with the violin. So, so can you play us something? I, I should say, should I play out the closing credits? I think yes, you should. That would be definitely. wonderful. Yes. No. So I guess you've, obviously, through the, did you, when you were sitting around the camp, you know, eating your day's wares, did yeah. you, were you still practising and no. stuff? No, my <laughs> practice was in the plaza in the morning, <laughs> okay. playing for two, three hours till I earned one, two euros okay. for a loaf of bread and some bananas. And then I'd get out of town and go walk because I had a long way to walk. As yeah, well. yeah, of course. No, I didn't play in the evenings. <laughs> Intro, from what we talked about before, though, I also on this trip, this was 2016, I had no, I didn't have any social media. I, I didn't look at social media. I didn't do any emails. I didn't have any music to listen to. I didn't have any books to read except the Laurie Lee book. It was mm. just, I just wanted to be me out in Spain with my violin. So I had a lot of empty time in the evenings just sitting around. You do things like trying to throw stones and hit a tree and <laughs> yeah, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, it comes back to what I was saying earlier, being with yourself, being yeah. present, being, you know, alone with your thoughts. Yeah. And I can't wait to hear this. Right. Yeah. Would, you like to, would you like to choose a song? Uh, Green well, Day, Basket Case. <laughs> oh, no, I don't, anything. Box. Concerto number 17 you, in you, e flat. You, I was going to say that next, actually. Okay. Yeah, that was that was my second choice, too. Okay. Well, unfortunately, I can only play five tunes. <laughs> uh, so so what are the choices, then? Given? Well, they're from the grade one music syllabus. <laughs> okay. um, so you could do your grade one exam, could you? I have done it. You've done it? Oh, okay. Okay. What I like you can point <laughs> yeah, me with the bow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I came yeah, home, I kept practising, and I took grade one, and I passed. Yay! Yes. Not with a merit, just a pass. Well, that's all right. That it doesn't counts. matter. I've got the certificate up in my shed, and then I retired. You... <laughs> Until now. Until, Until now. now. Oh, you have to try and name the tune. Do you know it yet? Uh, <laughs> nope. Hang on. Hang on. Oh no, even by my standards this is bad. <laughs> did, you, did you get what it was? No. The Muppet Show theme tune. Oh! oh do it again. Uh, one more try. <laughs> 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 That's when the show turned out. It's like an yeah. eye. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it. like if the Muppet show had been recorded on VHS that's warped. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. I haven't got any coins, unfortunately. So I take cards. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Um, Alastair Humphreys, thank you. So, this has been a wonderful, fascinating yeah, chat. Thank brilliant. you so much yeah. for thank joining you, us. Yeah, thank My you pleasure. So much. Thank you for having me. Brilliant. What a great guy. What a great guy. Yeah, that was brilliant. It was yeah. so interesting. The the I mean, I was particularly um astounded by the trip through Spain. Yeah. Um where he's busking. I mean, that is just incredible. And then he played for us as yeah, well. Yeah, and what? we couldn't get what the song was. No, but it was Um apologies <laughs> also for my uh, dreadful anecdotes at the top of the show. I mean, I don't know what's going on with me. I was a bit flustered that day, to be honest. Uh, no, I didn't I get busy. that vibe from you. Yeah, that well, I did. T- I started a an anecdote about expensive watches, which no, I thought it was know. interesting. And to yeah, be honest, the, but on this trade, podcast... well, no, I think you do rip me for it, and uh, <laughs> also a very boring anecdote about um, Southern Rail. So apologies, uh, <laughs> but you know, on this pod, anything goes. Yeah, but sometimes it shouldn't. <laughs> Um, look, well, no, thank you to Alistair for joining us. That was that was very interesting, and a bit of a different. Um, theme for us actually mm. which is nice on the pod keep it yeah and i think you'll i think we'll see 
let's see us in the next sort of uh, few months we'll be talking to a sort of wider range of people. I mean it's yeah. always been the plan to talk to lots of different people yeah. not just comedians and actors and I mean they're, they're brilliant to talk to too but um, talking to you know more sports people and people in other kind of um, areas of life that yeah. we you know who, who also have blank moments because exactly. as we know it is quite a universal thing. exactly exactly so uh, thank you Alistair very mm. much and so uh, you got a tweet I've got a tweet I'd like to read it's from Naomi Pullin and it sort of starts off a bit differently but then it comes back around so you'll, you'll get it as I read it but she says I remember when Rachel Shenton joined Hollyoaks and my first thought was what an annoying character <laughs> didn't take long for her to change my mind however um but how incredible is Rachel? Her drive, passion and dedication seem limitless. Fascinating insight into her life on The Blank Pod. That was a brilliant episode. And uh, yeah. thank you, Naomi, for those um, those kind words, which uh, I wasn't sure when I first started reading the tweet that it was going to be um, a bit harsher. But actually, it was very kind. And uh, yeah, it was a brilliant a brilliant episode, Rachel Shenton. So it's going back a little while, but yeah, do check it out if you haven't listened to it. That tweet was a bit of a journey, really, wasn't mm, it? Well, yeah, <laughs> a bit of a roller coaster. Um, and I've got one here from Hilda De Silva, brilliant name again, who says, "I'm loving Blank Pod. Blank Pod. Things don't have to be perfect all the time, but you get through them and you come out that much stronger." Beautifully said. Very, very nice. I've actually got another one I'd like to read, which is from uh, Katie Heath. It says, if you are looking for a podcast to listen to, head over to Charles and Jim's Blank Pod. Today, I am treating myself to the episode with Dawn French. Joy. <laughs> and then she's put a hashtag funny people, which is Lovely. nice. I've never been considered funny before, but it's very nice <laughs> to be considered that. Like. <laughs> it's official. Yeah. Um, so if you'd like to tweet us and let us know your favourite episode, our handle is... At Blank Pod. And you can also find us on Instagram and Facebook, uh, where it's exactly the same. Yeah, at Blank Pod. And please, please, please tell everyone you know to subscribe yes. to this show, because it does help. Helps us get up the chart and then more people yeah. see it. So, yeah. We want visibility as our main... Yeah, goal. Share the pod. Yeah. Maybe you could let us know how you're sharing the pod. Yes. this week. And actually, I'm going to put a thing out on social media. So it'd be good if anyone's listening at this point in the podcast, because obviously we've been talking for over an hour. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we have still got some very exclusive blank pod mugs. Oh yeah. So it might be an idea. So keep an eye out on social media. We'll have to formulate something, but it might be that we can get some people to do some nice reviews. And the best one will get a mug. There we go. That's a great idea. Yeah. I've got one of those mugs and the tea tastes amazing. It tastes it? so much better yeah. out of it. It does. It's, the clarity is oh, unbelievable. It's, it's beautiful. Anyway, that's the end of this week's pod. Giles, have a great week. And you, Jim. Thanks, mate. And to all our listeners, of course. And we'll see you again next week on The Blank Podcast. <laughs>